cannot tell the story of Alderson without talking about the railroad. But even before the railroad, there was John Hallister. Palliser was an Irish-born geographer and explorer. Between 1857 and 1859, he led expeditions which covered the area from Lake Superior through to the Pacific Ocean. In his report, he described a vast, arid area which was completely unsuitable for agricultural purposes. This area would become known as the Palliser Triangle. The history of Western Canada may have unfolded in a very different manner, if not for this man, John McCown. McCown was a member of five surveying expeditions for the Canadian Pacific Railway between 1871 and 1881. These expeditions happened to coincide with an exceptionally wet period for the area, which mistakenly led McCown to overestimate the agricultural potential of the Palliser Triangle. Armed with McCowan's reports, the Canadian Pacific abandoned their plans of building the railway along the North Saskatchewan River Valley, and instead opted for a more direct southern route, right through the heart of the Palliser Triangle. As part of the contract for the building of the railway, the Canadian government had granted 25 million acres of land to Canadian Pacific. Canadian Pacific was eager to begin an intense campaign promoting increased immigration to Canada and settlement along the new rail line. The land rush was on and it was this push to settle the Canadian prairies that set the stage for what would become the town of Alderson. In 1910, the CPR surveyed the town site of what was then known as Karlstadt. That name would last until 1915, when the anti-German sentiment of World War I caused the town people to change the name of their town to Alderson. With train cars full of colonists and settlers arriving constantly, Karlstadt was growing rapidly in those early days. Property values were soaring. By January of 1911, there were 35 occupied homes in the town. The first newspaper, the Karlstadt Progress, was formed in 1911 with Calvin Goss as editor. It was Goss who deemed Karlstadt to be the star of the prairie. Later that same year, 1911, Karlstadt was officially incorporated as a village with a population of 162 people. By 1913, the town was nearing its peak. It had multiple dry goods and general stores, three lumber companies, two implement dealers, two hardware stores, two churches, five hotels, two pool halls, a bakery, and a two-room schoolhouse, which was deemed one of the finest in the area. As the decade progressed, four grain elevators would grace the skyline along the railway tracks. As mentioned previously, it was during this boom period that the name changed from Karlstadt to Alderson. Even during the boom times, Alderson was faced with a series of challenges. As was commonplace in many prairie towns, fire was a constant threat. Alderson suffered a large loss when a fire took down a large portion of Main Street in 1914. And, of course, there was the drought. The years between 1917 and 1922 were especially dry, leading to a series of crop failures. As the 1920s rolled on, more and more people began to leave. Many buildings were demolished or moved to neighboring towns. By 1931, the population had dwindled to just 81. On January 31st, 1936, the village of Alderson 
was officially dissolved. A post office, the school, and a store survived through the 1940s, but all were closed in the 1950s and then disappeared from the landscape. My first visit to Alderson came in 2010, 100 years after the CPR had first surveyed the town site. At that time, the only building remaining was what appeared to be an old railway section house. The star of the prairie had become an empire of dust. Another fire would sweep over the Alderson town site in 2014 and take down that last remaining building. So come with us today as we pay a visit to the Alderson town site and let's see what's left here in 2019. One of the things I am most interested to try and find is to see if I can find any remnants of the old schoolhouse. Because I know on the town map where the school was located, and if I can find that, it'll help me anchor everything else in terms of location. Yeah, it was your standard two-room schoolhouse kind of an entrance in the middle and classrooms on both sides. This looks like the school to me because you've got one corner of the foundation here and then where it... Ooh! <laughs> Sorry little buddy. And then where it juts out here was probably the main entrance. Yeah, so I would say that was probably the entrance to the school. And I have a photo taken of the south side of the school with a bunch of people standing in front of it. And in the background on the left side, you can see the grain elevators. So that would have been taken right along in here where this foundation is. And just over here to the southwest of the school, it looks like there's another foundation or basement here. And it looks like it has a vehicle of some sort in it. Oh! Oh! multiple vehicles. Oh, wow. That one's pretty. This one has little tan flowers. Mm -hmm. So there's a rare moment here where the wind has sort of died down a bit, so you can actually maybe hear some of the audio, but uh, we've come down here to the far southeast corner of or what we believe would have been the far southeast corner of Alderson. And uh, we're going to make our way over to the west and check out a few more of the main cross streets, including trying to find the famous Broadway and Railway intersection. It's kind of the center of the business district of Alderson.
So this should be about where the corner of Alberta Avenue and Broadway Street was. Now I don't know what building this was, but if these bricks are actually original to the site, it must have been quite an important building to be occupying this corner and to be made out of that sort of construction materials. A bank, perhaps? Some kind of harvesting equipment? Yeah, some piece of machinery. Whatever building was here seems to have had some sort of a dugout basement up front and then just extended beyond at ground level. So maybe it was one of the lumber yards? I don't know. That's pure speculation on my part. Oh, but now here is something I don't need to speculate on. I know exactly what this is. This is an old safe and... Uh, Certainly it has seen better days, but, you know, what's probably been a century of sitting outdoors on the prairie hasn't, uh, hasn't done it any favors. You can see at the back of this one, there used to be a, an entrance going down into the basement. That was probably the back entrance of whatever this was. And over here is yet another safe. So that's the second one we found here on the site. I don't know if this was like the banking district or if these are even tied to a bank in any way. It's probably just a matter of these things were big, heavy, hard to move. And so they were just left behind when the town uh, disappeared. So this here was the corner of Broadway and Railway, and behind me you can see the foundation of the England and England block. The England and England block housed the land office for the area, so it would have been one of the first places people stopped at after coming off the train to their new home. This is looking to the southeast across Broadway. Okay, I think this is really cool. This is a picture from The Empire of Dust by David C. Jones showing the foundation and remnants of the England and England block. And you can see this H piece of wood in the foreground of this photo. Well, if you look today, that same piece of wood, that H-shaped section of wood, is still here. Now, his book was published in 1984, this is taken here in 2019, still there. Checking out a different basement over here. Is that a boiler? I'm not really sure, but it kind of looks like a boiler. That could have been part of the heating system of whatever building was here, or it could have been just dumped here years ago, long after the building was gone. It's hard to say. Checking out this interesting square concrete structure. Is that a well? No, well, it could be a well that's been filled in, or it may have just been the foundation of a pump house, or perhaps it was uh, part of the town windmill that stood along the main road. I'm not really sure. If anyone knows, please let, let me know. Throughout much of its existence... Alderson benefited from the traffic moving between Medicine Hat and Brooks, which came right through the heart of town along Railway Avenue, which is what this stretch would have been. In 1931, the Hat Brooks Highway was opened and it realigned the road and moved that just to the north of the railway tracks, and that caused a lot of traffic to stop visiting Alderson. Now, even though 1931 was well beyond the heyday of Alderson, I mention that because Frank Steed built a garage along that new highway in an attempt to get more traffic to stop and visit the town site. And I believe what we're looking at here is the remnants of Frank Steed's service station slash garage.
as we get ready to say farewell to Alderson, at least for this visit, it seems appropriate to come by and visit a location that would have been the site of many final goodbyes. And that, of course, is the Alderson Cemetery, located just east of the main town site proper. It's one of the most tangible remnants of the town site. And my understanding from various sources is that there's only about 12 burials left in the cemetery and the rest of the remains have been moved to other locations over the decades since it was active. So that's going to wrap it up for our visit to Alderson. I really hope you enjoyed coming along and learning a little bit of the history about this location. A huge, huge recommendation. Get the book from David C. Jones, Empire of Dust. It goes into great detail about Alderson and the entire Palliser Triangle. Far more detail than I could ever get into in this format on YouTube. But it's a great book. It's an interesting read. It is a must-own for any prairie historian. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go put the drone up in the air and take a look at the uh, town site of Alderson from the air. And uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much.